Welcome, church family. Linda and I would like to welcome you into service today. And today is a special day. We're celebrating Pentecost Sunday. This is the most unknown of the Christian holidays, and it's the least celebrated, but it's one of the most important days. This is the day that the Holy Spirit of God was poured out. It's the day that the church was born. And at Servant's Heart Worship Center, we will always celebrate with fervor Pentecost Sunday because it's the very birth of the church. Many years ago, there was pollution in California uh, at record numbers, and all the experts got together to try to figure out uh, how to fix the problem. And they took two years and they did the study. And finally, some guy gets up, and the official, and he, he kind of gives an account of what they had found out about this air pollution. And he said, there's really no way to fix it immediately. The only way to fix it right away is if we had a wind that would blow in from the east and blow out all the pollution out to sea. I believe that that's what the day of Pentecost means for believers. It's the day that the wind of the Holy Spirit, like a mighty rushing wind, blew into that upper room, and it ended up blowing throughout the whole world. It changed the world. A wind that blew in from the east. The church at that time was corrupt, and it blew all the pollution out of the church and gave us a fresh start. So as you think about Pentecost Sunday, just think of all of the ways, the important ways that the Holy Spirit is vital to your Christian life. And ask God to fill you with His Holy Spirit to capacity. It'll change your life forever. The children could be dismissed at this time. And I'd like to introduce Brother Ken Unger to bring us the word today. God bless you. Good morning. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Do you wish you'd have been there on the day of Pentecost? Some people have, hmm, I don't know if I wanted to be that far back or not, but uh, anyway. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin this message this morning. Father, I come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I'm so thankful for your blessings. And I ask now, Father, your anointing, Father, upon me as I deliver the word, the message that you've given to me, Father, as you've laid it upon my heart, Father, that it would touch hearts and lives today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You know, I jokingly told certain people who were in the sound booth <laughs> that I had 100 scriptures for today. After they recovered from almost passing out, they found out it wasn't quite that many. But we want to go back to the book of Joel. Why go back to the book of Joel? Because Joel, a prophet that was almost unknown, one small book in the Bible, there's almost no information about him, but he wrote this word in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 29. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we find the fulfillment of that prophecy where it reads, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And y'all want to stop there for just a moment. Because I think that's part of the problem in the church today. It's hard to get us all together in one accord in one place. And so many times we walk into a church and we see so much dispute, disagreement, other things going on that you wonder how in the world 
does that church survive? But it says, they were all in one accord and in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now I want to back up just a little bit here. They were during a time that was being celebrated, this known as Shabbat. And because of differences in the Jewish lunar calendar and the Gregorian calendar that we use, these holidays, these times don't always line up. For example, we celebrated the time during the Passover where we celebrate the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. They celebrated it almost a month after we celebrated the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is when they celebrated Passover this year. So consequently, their Shabbat actually doesn't come till sometime next month. But we're going by the Gregorian calendar here, which is the one that's predominantly used throughout the world. And uh, here it means basically the seven-week period or the weeks between the Passover and this holiday. And there was a requirement because of this holiday which commemorates the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. There is a requirement at that time that all the Jews be in Jerusalem. It's one of those few times that you've got to be in Jerusalem. You've got to be there. And because of this requirement to be in Jerusalem for this festival known as Shabbat, there was large crowds in the city. And it was the perfect time for the event that was about to happen to take place. Now this event, of course, is what we refer to as Pentecost, which is the Greek word for 50. So Shabbat and Pentecost are actually two separate events. Shabbat is a festival. Pentecost is the 50-week period that happens, or the 50-day period, I should say, that happens after Passover. So let's back up just a few days from where we're going to be in the rest of the message. Because it's Friday. Jesus has been crucified. He's been nailed to the cross on Golgotha. And after his resurrection, he appears to many. And you know, this is an important thing. We don't often think about it, but it's very important that Jesus appeared to many. The scripture gives us just a few, and we're going to touch on just a couple of them. In Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 12, Jesus was, it says, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Then it goes on in verse 12 and says, after that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went unto the country. If you remember the story as it's told in another, cha in another book, he appeared to them and they didn't recognize who he was. They got to where they were going. They invite him in for dinner. He has dinner with them. All of a sudden, he's revealed to them. And they're just amazed. And suddenly, he's gone. Matthew chapter, excuse me, John chapter 21, verses 1 and 19. And I'm going to read just verse 1 here. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed himself. Then again in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. And the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. In verse 19, he, for he told them while they were there on the mountain, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then in Luke chapter 24, verses 33 through 36, 
it says, And they rose up in the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told him what things that were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. And as they speak, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace unto you. I want to stop right there just a minute. Can you imagine? You're gathered around here. You're having dinner. You're talking about the events that have happened. I mean, it's been a little rough for some of them because Jesus was crucified, then He rose from the dead, but they're not quite sure what they're going to do yet. I mean, we've spent three years out here uh, with Jesus evangelizing and, and trying to, to bring this message to the people. And now what do we do? It must have been a little bit, you know, confusing to them possibly as to what the next step was. And I can assure you that each and every one of you have experienced times in your lives, especially in your Christian life, when you've experienced that situation. What do I do now? But the thing we've got to remember is Jesus has the answer. And sometimes we just have to give Him a little time to reveal what that answer is to us. I know I've experienced that in my life several occasions where I had to give Him a little time to work things out the way He wanted it, not how I wanted it. Going on there in verse 48, or excuse me, verse 49, he says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into the heaven. Now John writes then in the book of Acts these words in Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 5. These former treaties have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which He was taken up. After that, He through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom He had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive. Remember? All those occasions that we mentioned there, he showed himself alive. By after he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father, which he sa which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And while he had spoken these things, excuse me, getting ahead of myself <laughs> So he's telling them now to go wait in Jerusalem. So we want to skip now to Acts chapter 6. Or excuse me, Acts chapter 1 verses 5 through 9. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, when thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel. And he saith unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons, but the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and unto all Judea, and into Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they were, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So he's got them set up now for the events that are going to take place ten days from then. Ten days. The disciples at that time, obedient, they go back to Jerusalem, which basically was 
where they were at at this event was roughly about three quarters of a mile, I think, from where the city of Jerusalem itself. They went back to Jerusalem. Obviously, they found a place to stay because the next chapter, chapter 2, tells us they were gathered together in an upper room. And uh, I want to read this next one to you, this next verse is to you, out of the complete Jewish Bible. Now, unfortunately, we couldn't put that up because they don't have that particular version in their file back there. But here's what it says. The festival of Shabbat had arrived, and the believers all gathered together in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from the sky like the roar of a violent wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire which separated and came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the rock HaKadosh and began to talk in different languages as the Spirit enabled them. They were gathered together in one place. And here's another key word again. They were in one accord. They were in one place. They were in one accord. And you know what's just downright amazing? In fact, sometimes miraculous what God can do when we as believers gather together in one accord in one place. What God can do. They had that mighty move of the Holy Spirit that's talked about there and as you go on and you read down in the book of Acts here, chapter 2, verses 12 and verse 13, and they've come out of the room, they're going out into the crowd that's gathered out there, and it says, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others, mocking, said, these men are full of new wine. In other words, these guys are drunk. I mean, how in the world could they be going on like this, especially at this time of the day? Because it wasn't in the evening time. It was closer to noon. And verses 12 through 13 in the, Lib in the New Living Translation says, They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked of each other. But the others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk. And I can imagine, you know, if we weren't expecting this and we were gathered together and we saw a group of people come down like this, we might think the same thing. Because that's how the world thinks. And I can remember, since I'm older than a lot of you, I can remember some things that happened before a lot of you were born. But I can remember some of the moves of the Holy Spirit that took place in the 50s and the 60s. And I remember one lady telling my mom one time, let's go up to that particular church that, that she didn't know we attended that church. Let's go up to that church because they're, they're having these gatherings up there and these people are, are, are doing all kinds of crazy things and let's just go up there and mock them. And that's kind of the way this crowd that was gathered out there was fixing to do. They were going to make fun of them. Look at those drunks. How can they be that way this early in the day? We ought to have them all arrested and throw them slammer. Maybe ten days in the dungeon would straighten them out. That might have been what some of them were thinking. But then, Peter steps forward in verses 14 through 20. And it says, Peter stepped forward with the eleven after other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. He said unto them, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up servants, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. It 
So there we have these events taking place. Jesus is, or Peter is preaching a word to them. He goes on to tell them that in verse 19, and so then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and he went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Now in the New Living Translation, verses 37 and 38, Peter goes on to say, And Peter's words pierced their heart, and they said unto him and to the other apostles, Brother, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to show that you have received the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want to point something out right here too. Because what he's saying to them, you know, there's some people that teach that, well, you go get baptized and you're saved. You're okay. Some churches teach you, know, you take a baby and you dip some water and sprinkle it on its head. And that baby's saved. Or maybe they, they dunk you in a pond somewhere. Or in a baptistry. You're saved. There was no asking for forgiveness of sins involved in that. That is a sign that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord. He is your Savior. And you're doing this. Creating like being dunked into the water. The old life gone. The new life coming out. Being saved. He said, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now it goes on in verse 41 and says, And those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. That's quite a, quite a big crowd. I think about some of the meetings that we have watched on TV. How many have watched some of the great revival or services on TV? Uh, for example, Billy Graham. Probably all of us have at some time or another. And you see the multitudes come down. And yeah, sometimes you might see 3,000 people walk down. But unfortunately, what you see on TV isn't always what it really is. And he said himself, probably only really about 10% really met it. Because somebody wanted somebody to get saved. And they walked over and said, you come with me down to the altar and get saved. So he walks down to the altar with him. I don't know what I'm going down with this guy. I'll just make him happy. I don't want to cause a scene. And so they yeah, okay. Dear Jesus, forgive me my sin. Amen. And they walk out of that place the same person they were when they came in. But he's talking about an experience when we accept Jesus Christ into my heart, into our heart, and we may with tears flowing from our eyes or some other sign of emotion possibly, Jesus, forgive me my sin. Come into my heart. And we're crying out from our heart. We really mean what we're saying. Because we want Jesus to be our Savior. We want Him to come into our life and change us. And we walk forward from there being a new creature. Some of you maybe had some things that were going on in your life when you got saved that changed. And people could see that change in your life when you got saved. Now I have to say, when I got saved, people couldn't see a lot of change in my life because I've been raised in church all my life. That was all I knew. So there was not a lot of change that people could see in that way, but yet there was that change in my heart. So miracles begin to happen. Things begin to happen. People got saved. The church was born. And it goes on to tell us in Acts chapter 3 verses 1 through 11 it talks about the lame man that's on his way to the temple. 
Peter comes up and he's been lame all of his life since the day he was born. Peter comes up to him. And the next thing you know, that man's thrown his crutches down. He's walking and dancing into the temple. See, I'm saved. I'm, I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. He moved about. Oh, I tell you, it caused a stir. Some of these things, if you haven't, if you've forgotten some of the story, go back and read it again. Acts chapter 3. It goes on in Acts chapter 5. Verse 12 it says, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. There's that word again. We're in one accord. One accord. And that doesn't mean you're driving a Honda. Okay? We were in one accord. We were of the same mind. Acts 5.12. Excuse me. Get ahead of myself there again. Acts 5.14-15, through 15, rather. And believers were more added to the church, multitudes, both of men and women, insomuch that they were brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. And at the least, the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow them. Just think about it. The power was so strong that Peter walked down the street. Boy, they tried to shove their loved ones and the ones that need healing and miracles in their life. They tried to shove them out where just his shadow would be cast upon them. And they would be healed and delivered. How many of you would like to see things like that happen today? I know I sure would. And what happened on the day of Pentecost was not just a one time or a few days event. Think about it. We we're almost we we're right at two thousand years later. And things like that can still happen. But it takes us getting in that one accord moment. Goes on and gives some other things that took place. Stephen, I tell you, I, I, uh, this particular story, I'm not going to read the whole story out of the Scripture to you today. I'm just going to kind of go over it with you. But the story of Stephen, Stephen, the first martyr, it says in chapter 7, he's, he's uh, preaching to the council. And in other words, this is the leader of the city. This is the leaders of the temple. And he's having to explain some things to them. And he's preaching a message to them. And I want to read this one out of the complete Jewish Bible, which uh, unfortunately they don't have. It says here, on hearing these things, they were cut to the heart and ground their teeth in. And then their minds, we've got to do something with this dude. We can't put up with him. But he, full of the rock, Hakadesh, looked up into the heavens and saw God's Shekinah With Yeshua standing at the right hand of God. And look, he exclaimed, I see the heaven opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And I think about that. Here's a guy that preached to him. And the Holy Spirit was around him. He said, Is they're getting ready to kill him? They're stony. And he can look up and say, I see Jesus. He's standing at the right hand of God. And I can see the glory of God. 
I can see the fullness of what I'm going to. He saw it. They may have stoned him to death, but they didn't stop his testimony. Goes on in Acts chapters 19, verses 11 through 12, and it says, And God wrote special miracles by the hands of Paul. I'm going to stop right there for just a minute. How do you know what a prayer cloth is? I see a few hands that go up. Prayer cloth, it can be a handkerchief. It could be just a little cloth that was cut out of the material specifically for the purpose of being a prayer cloth. It's anointed with oil. And a lot of times we do this to send it to those that we know need prayer that for whatever reason Maybe we can't get too personally or, or, or we need it to be an outstanding event. And we've used prayer cloths here in this church. In the church I was pastoring in Columbia, we had prayer cloths. In fact, just recently I went to visit a lady in the hospital. She had just given birth to twins at 20, I think it was 22 or 23 weeks. I mentioned it here a couple of weeks ago when I asked it prayer for them. Little tiny things about this long. They looked more like a baby puppy than they did a human being. So I gave her though on the day before she gave birth, I had visited her and I gave her that prayer call. And one of those babies, they were both born, one survived, one did not. But the one is still in there hanging in. And God is going to do, I think, miracles for that baby. But we've had people here in this church request prayer cloths because we are sending that anointing. We're sending something that was prayed over. And just as they did with Paul, where they took cloths from his body, it says, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. So when somebody gives you a prayer cloth, it's not just something that somebody in their whim made up. Oh, here, take this piece of cloth, pour a little oil on it, and we'll send it to you. You know. But the Bible tells us about this. It goes on. Also, other events that happened on the day of Pentecost that we read about in other books of the Bible. The gifts of the Spirit. Now here's where some of us can sometimes get into trouble. Because the gifts of the Spirit as listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 4. Let's read that one first and then we're going to skip down a couple of verses. It says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Then in verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, and to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. Now those are the gifts of spirit. But I want to back up just a little bit in Galatians 5.22 because it talks about the fruits of the spirit. And here's the one where we sometimes can get in trouble. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Those are the examples that we as Christians should be showing. Love, gentleness, all of these things. And what's one of the biggest complaints you hear about Christians today? They were mean, ugly acting, spiteful, all kinds of things like are we really letting the fruits of the Spirit be shown? Because I don't care who you are. You're supposed to be 
exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit. Showing all those things. Is it hard sometimes? It sure is. Especially if somebody comes up and is really mean to you or hateful to you or does something evil to you, it's kind of hard sometimes to let the fruit of the Spirit show through. But we are to let the fruits of the Spirit be made manifest. And then the gifts of the Spirit, not everyone has all of those gifts. Some may have one gift and none of the others. Some may have several gifts and not all of them. And I know there are some that may have all the gifts. And we see these things exhibited. Okay. We've talked about events that took place almost 2,000 years ago. And I know people can look around and say, well, I hate it's been a long time, man. How does this apply to me today? Well, I still want to go back in time a little bit. But we're only going back to 1906. We got 1900 years ahead. 1906, there was the Azusa Street Revival. How many of you have heard of the Azusa Street Revival? You know, here's one of the interesting things about the Azusa Street Bible because the Pentecostal movement, several church denominations, the Assemblies of God, uh, uh, Church of God, uh, several others were born out of that movement. Some directly and some a little bit indirectly out of it. But here's one of the things that I think was kind of really interesting about that event. How many believes God can use you? Okay, a few of you believe that. Yeah. Well, wouldn't most of us think if God is going to have such a movement as took place on Azusa Street, that he's going to use, well, let's just say a Billy Graham, for example, because all of us know who Billy Graham is. Send him in there, and that's what's going to happen, man. He's going to go down there, and he's going to preach, and all of these things are going to take place. But this proves that God can use anybody. Because you see, it was led by a guy by the name of William J. Seymour. How many of you have heard of him? Well, there was two or three hands, I think, went up. William J. Seymour. Now, I didn't get all the details on it, but William J. Seymour was a little black man. He was in poor health. He was blind in one eye. His parents were emancipated slaves. And he was the second of eight children in his family. Had very little education. In other words, one of the last persons in the world you would expect for something like this to happen. He's a nobody. But yet, he obeyed the calling of God. Went to a street in Los Angeles called Azusa Street where they rented a little old beat up place and I didn't write all the details down about it, but uh, it wasn't that great of a place. It wasn't a fancy building. And God began to move. And they had an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in that place just as they did on the day of Pentecost. And one of the things that I remember that happened, and I wasn't there, but I remember being told about it happening. I'm not that old. I remember being told about it happening. One of the things that really stood out in my mind was one night the fire department got called. They didn't have 911 then. Operator? You need to give me the fire department. There's a big fire going on in this building down here on Azusa Street. You know, it's that old warehouse place where those people are preaching at right now. They got a fire. I can see flames leaping out the roof. 
fire department responds. They see the flames, but it's not the kind they can put out. Because it was the flames of the Holy Spirit that were coming out of the roof that were being made visible to those who believed or didn't believe. God moved in that place. As I said, the Pentecostal movement as we know it today was born out of that revival. Other events took place around that time. I remember in the 50s. Yeah, I was alive then. In the 50s. Some of the things that I either witnessed myself or knew somebody who did. One of them was when I got saved. You see, I told you I was raised up in church. But that didn't make me a Christian. Oh, y'all, people considered me a Christian because I went to church. In fact, when they would go out witnessing and stuff, I would be sometimes put in charge of some of the groups, even though I was only a teenager, because I was one of the more knowledgeable ones about church and stuff. In the Bible, in my age group there. But one day in a Sunday school class, Sunday school teacher asked the question, how many of you have never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Raise your hand. Well, I don't know. Helen. This other kid in class, his name was Richard, a couple of years older, and he raised his hand. Okay, she said. She didn't look at Richard then. She looked at me and said, Kenneth, have you ever been saved? Well, she kind of called me out on that. And I said, no. She said, okay, we're going to pray tonight that when we have tonight's service, there's going to be a move of God. Richard's going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and Kenneth's going to get saved. Okay. Went home. Came back to church that night. I think churches back then started about 7.30 on Sunday night. How many of you remember Sunday night services? Yeah. A lot of great things went on in Sunday night services. 7.30. We're singing. Piano's playing, the organ's playing, the song leader's leading the music. And all of a sudden, things change. I think we were maybe the second or third song. And somebody came back and led me up to the altar. Richard went up to the altar too. Now, this is 7.30 in the evening. I'm going to tell you something. My next recollection doesn't happen until almost 10 o'clock at night. Because not only did I got saved, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't remember what was going on around me. Now, this is a church of 100 or more people. You know, get just a few people in here and they could get noisy. But with all that was going on, I have no recollection of what was going on around me. I just know I was in that blessed quietness. And I happened to think the other day there was a song written called Blessed Quietness in 1897. That song was written. And there's only that one line that says Blessed Quietness. That's when God's Spirit moves upon us and we get that quietness in our, our spirit and our being where we know nothing about what's going on around us. Because we are immersed in the presence of God. We are feeling His presence so real in our life. Now I do know one thing. I know that the altar in a specific place roughly about the center of the auditorium. So it would be roughly about where I'm standing here. Where I knelt at the altar. I do know that finally when I came out of that blessed quietness moment and I had been filled with the Spirit, I was in the community. I don't know how it got there. I don't know what happened. But I just knew it changed my life. Now, I know it didn't make drastic changes on the outside where people could say, man, 
he used to be doing this and that, and he's not doing it now because I lived better than most Christians did. But I wasn't a Christian. Living a good life doesn't make you a Christian. But there was that moment in my life, that experience. I knew a preacher back in the in the seventies. He was a Vietnam veteran. He was one of these lucky people who got called in for the draft. And while he's standing in the hallway waiting for the army to take him, the Marines walk down the aisle and say, Hmm, you look like the one we need. And they say, We'll take him. And then they go on and say, We'll take this one, you know, and so on. So he got drafted into the Marines. And he was in the midst of a situation in Vietnam where there was only him and a couple other guys. And they had a moment that I can say was only directed by a miraculous intervention because they're standing in an open field and he was praying with them about something. I don't remember all the details, but he was praying with them about something. And when they opened their eyes, in prayer, standing out of this open field, they realized they were surrounded by the Viet Cong, basically. Not completely surrounded in a circle, but enough going past them that they were dead meat, basically. And he said they stood there, probably thinking to themselves, we're goners now. And they watched as soldier after soldier in the Viet Cong army walked right on past them. Never knew they existed. Now that's a miracle. That's what happens when miracles take place. Things of that event. Dennis lost his leg during Vietnam. As I said, went on to become an evangelist. And the church we were going to had just started a, a new church called Faith Gospel Temple. We were meeting in a theater building. Seated 900 people. I'll be honest, we didn't have anywhere close to 900 people, but that's where we were meeting at because it was available to us. Dennis is holding a revival. And I know some of you have heard stories about things that have taken place in Pentecostal events. You watch some preachers and you say, I don't believe what they're doing there. He's shoving them down or whatever because they think what we call slain in this book. He's laying hands on them. He puts his hand on their head. And he does like this, and bang, the guy goes back. But that's because he went bam, you know. Well, I understand why some people doubt some of this, because some things like that do happen. But that's not a God when it happens that way. The dentist was holding this revival meeting. We came down, we had a service that night. Services started about, say about 7.30. This is a weeknight. We sometimes don't get out till almost midnight. He's holding the meeting. He calls us down for prayer. We line up single file all the width of that auditorium. Now I told you Dennis lost a leg. So he didn't necessarily go up and lay hands on people. Sometimes he'd stand back like this and reach out. He never physically touched a lot of things. And that night, I don't remember whether he physically touched the first person in the line or not. But all I know is, one by one, every person in that line was slain in the Spirit because there was a move of God that was taking place. And there was those blessed quietness moments. And you could, as I like to say, you could hear a pin drop. Because the Spirit of God was so there that you could feel that. Miracles took place in the 50s and 60s that I got to witness. I remember there was a lady that brought to the church. I was still a teenager, I think, at that point. And I was helping run the church sound system. They brought her in a station wagon. She was going to die. She had days left. She wanted to come to church one last time. We ran a speaker out to the back of that station wagon where she could hear the service. 
They started off like they always did on Sunday night with their chorus, welcome, welcome all of you. And we don't get much past the first song until all of a sudden the Spirit of God began to move. And they went out to that station wagon. Pray for Dolores. Dolores got up out of the back of that station wagon and started walking around. After church, they took her home. She walked around the block. I remember correctly, she walked quite a ways. Dolores went on to become a preacher and a pastor because of a miracle of God that took place. Over the period of years, I've watched other things like that take a place that I, I personally witnessed. I want to tell you about an experience I had. I've not shared it with very many people, but not quite 12 years ago, I had had open heart surgery and I had complications. And one of the complications was my sodium level dropped to lethal levels. In other words, one doctor told me I should have been dead when he saw me. And I'm in the hospital. The church I was pastoring was going through some changes and some things taking place. I was crying, God, what do I do? And all of a sudden, that person cries. They're in the hospital. And I remember these words. Just as if God had been standing in my room where he said, my precious, precious child. I don't remember all the rest of it, but basically he said, don't worry about it, i got to take care of it. And he did. Sometimes we need those precious, blessed, quietness moments in our life where God can speak to our hearts and God can move in our lives. God does move in lives today. He touches hearts. But we've got to want it. As we all stand, I want to ask you here, first of all, the most important question. While every head is bowed, every eye is closed, is there anyone here that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? I want to pray for you.